Good evening, New York, and welcome to Brass Tax, produced by Frederick Brass. I'm Coley Clark from the Judicial Violence Symposium, and I'm your host for this evening. And you see me all excited and shaking my head and stuff? I am so happy that I have a game with me, Kevin Unnett. Kevin Unnett is the very powerful and famous young man who's done such <laughs> <laughs> great work in such a short lifespan. And Kevin, I hope he doesn't get shorter. No, but well, the, the work is fine. <laughs> and I've been out here in civil rights and human rights for a long time. Mm. And I know that the evil go after men and women like you, children like you, uh, when they are doing the work of exposing the ugly violence and evil that we have in our world. I am so excited this evening, Kevin, to talk about a second book on your road tour. <laughs> you are going to be touring the United States. Oh, uh, what are you looking at? Nine weeks, ten weeks? Well, as long as it takes. <laughs> as long as it takes to get the word out. <laughs> well, you can't get it out in Canada anymore because Canada has, in fact, uh, placed Kevin on his watch list. And we need to be talking about that New York because Kevin does need our protection and our care. And we should make sure that the great men and women who have done the work of exposing the evils, whether it's the evil of Canada or the U.S. or whatever, uh, don't get uh, removed and unable to do that work in multiple kinds of ways. They move King with a bullet and others with bullets, but they move us and remove us in other ways as well, making it impossible to, to, to live, making it impossible to find housing, making it impossible to live a normal life. Kevin's on road tour and he's out here presenting his book to the world, Unrelenting, Between Sodom and Zion by Kevin on that. And for those of you who saw the last show, his major work, his major work, Murder by Decree. Murder by Decree, the crime of genocide in Canada. And all of this is about Canada's up and up, hot, cold machinery to censor the truth in the stories that are being told by Kevin Annette. But what I like about this story, Kevin, this is your story. This is the 20-year the saga, well, longer than 20 years now, of me learning about the murder of children in the Indian residential schools, uh, talking about it and getting fired, not just fired from my church, but expelled from my livelihood, uh, losing my family over it, um, being blacklisted across the country and attacked in, in countless ways. Uh, not even because of me so much as what I was bringing out, what I, what I represented, which is Canada's guilty conscience that it committed mass murder and is still continuing those same crimes against Native people and, and many other groups. You know, Kevin, I was looking here at, 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 at your preference and going through and looking at your dedication, and I was remarked, I rem just uh, moved to tears when I read a little bit of this. and. I want to read it to New York. But then this is Kevin writing. But the biggest impact you've had has been on my 10 year old daughter. He's speaking to a native woman, a native woman who is talking to Kevin about his impact on her life and that of her family. She watched your film with me the other night and she was in tears by the end. She said to me, now, now I guess my grandmother can have some peace wherever she is. This is a missing Native woman among the multiple missing Native women in Canada. She doesn't have to be alone anymore. This reverend has helped her to go to the light. Right, Mama? And the reverend she's referring to is to Kevin. And I told her, yes, that's true. And she smiled, a big smile, and said, I don't know that Reverend Mom, but I'm sure glad he is alive. In New York, you're famous for it. We're going to keep Kevin on that <laughs> alive. Unrelenting between Sodom and Zion. 
And Kevin is not alone because Kevin is going to go all the way back to 1761. <laughs> and that's the other Kevin. <laughs> well, that's a... That Where things <laughs> began. Uh, yeah. My ancestors. Yeah, that is yes. an ancestor. Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about that well, ancestor? He's remarkable. One of, man. The, one of the reasons I wrote this book is people kept asking, well, what the uh, questions I continue to get from people is how did you have the stamina to do no, this? No, no, no. Before you go, let, let, let me say this. I got to say this from 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 the other Peter and that. Yeah. 1761, October the 17th, 1761, a great date. I believe that's Jesse Jackson's birthday. I can't remember. What up? We shall expose the hidden works of the darkness and drive falsity Falsity. to the bottomless pit. Right. Well, that was Peter Peter, Peter Annan, my ancestor. Speaking in the free inquiry. He was uh, challenging the dogma and the oppression of the Crown of England and the Church of England, and they locked him in the stocks for it, put him at hard labor when he was in his 70s. And um, people kept asking me, what are the influences? How do you keep going in all this work? And, And I realized that part of it is the my own lineage and the fact that we came from a long line of free thinkers and rebels and people who paid the price for doing these things. We were Baptists in England when it was a crime to be a Baptist. We had to come to Canada for that reason. Um, and it's, it's kind of ironic because my ancestor had been a British Army officer who fought at Waterloo and was given wa- land in what was called Upper Canada. It's Ontario now. Waterloo. What is Waterloo? The Battle of Waterloo, 1815, where the British fought Napoleon. And uh, they, as he, a British officer, he was given all this land in Canada, uh, from taken from Native people. And in a way, I often viewed it as perhaps part of the way that I compensated that in our own family for having done that, uh, trying to get to the truth of what my people had done in the name of their God to uh, to so mm. many other people, Native people. Well, that's unrelenting. Between Sodom and Zion. Now we're to this title, Between Sodom and Zion. Talk about this title, Kevin. I'm really excited by it. Well, it uh, when I started in this work, I didn't really understand what I was dealing with. You know, I thought that, well, if you tell enough of the truth, you get enough of the eyewitnesses to tell the, the, their stories. The people who are responsible will sit up and say, yeah, we're wrong, let's do justice. But, you know, I had to f- get a few whacks in the head uh, to realize that what I uncovered was the norm of things, was the way that this society is. And I was blind to that for a long time. And I realized that I had been thrown out of a fallen city, if you like, Sodom. Um, there is a judgment, I believe, on my culture and my people for what we have instigated in the world for many centuries. And I don't mean simply white people, because any culture can fall prey to this. Mm -hmm. A lot of the native chiefs today in Canada are part of the problem as well, because they've been given benefits to cover up this story as well. Um, But it is the the culture that maybe my people epitomize that is devastating the planet and has so much blood on its hands that I don't think it's redeemable. I think there we have to leave the, f- the fallen city, if you like, and head to Zion, the new city. We've got we to gotta reclaim the world. We've got to reclaim our own souls and our own minds. And I learned that the hard way by having a lot stripped away from me in life, my family, my children, my livelihood. But I'm glad for all that now because it opened my eyes, my heart. I was captive to four. I was a captive of the city in S- of Sodom, if you like. You were captive in Sodom. I was you captive. You know, Kevin begins his career in Sodom. It's really, you've got to read this story. It's, it is, uh, this book is absolutely revealing of who Kevin is. I've been meeting with Kevin a few years now, but nothing brought me to know Kevin like unrelenting between Sodom and Zion. I like that, Zion. But Kevin, as a young, young man in Canada, a kid, so to speak, a brassy little <laughs> uppity brat. <laughs> yeah, that's what my dad called <laughs> I knew so many of in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia oh. in the civil rights struggle. Uh, Gavin was, was young and very bright. He was not a, a child of great poverty. Uh, Kevin and word, we would say, you know, we'd be asking him, boy, what's wrong with you? You got plenty. Just go over there somewhere and sit down and enjoy yourself. But not this child. This is an uppity brat. <laughs> and you have got to read about this, Brad. Uh, I was really struck, Kevin, about that first 16 years. Mm. As a young man in school in Canada, yeah. 
and in home, in a family, growing up in a family, and can talk with us a bit about that. Because to hear that, I think, is a revelation about why you will be driven to topple the most powerful, one of the most powerful figures on earth, a pope. That's a whole story in itself. Yes, yeah. I know. Bye-bye <laughs> uh, Pope Benedict. Uh, <laughs> that was directly because of the work we did. But anyway, um, uh, you know, one of the incidents I talk about in there is when I was uh, 14, uh, we went up, and by we, I mean our United Church Sunday School group, mm -hmm. did an exchange with uh, a native community in northern British Columbia, of the Simshin people. And it was my first encounter with, with native people. I mean, as a Canadian, you see a lot of native people on the street and everything, but you don't really know them. Mm -hmm. There's this total apartheid divide, you know, uh, still very much today. And we went up to this village, which was very much untouched. And I remember ge I described, we get off the bus, and I had never seen children um, so wild and free. Like, mm -hmm. they had a lot of trouble. I remember a lot of them were sick, and uh, they were going around without shoes, proper clothing. One little girl had a mark on her head. They, her dad had hit her with an ax when he was drunk. No. I mean, you know, like, it was a totally different reality, like, if you like, third world reality. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yet these kids were um, just freer than anyone I had ever met. And mm -hmm. they didn't seem to have the apprehension and fear that my growing up in my culture you have as a child, right? We're always being told to do something rather than what you want to do, but do somebody else's notion of what's right, you know. So um, I mean, uh, these kids were uh, in the village. They were all running around totally uh, unconstrained. And then the, the clan mother shows up. This woman gets out of a car, and they're all quiet. <laughs> and they're all showing this total respect. And... I realized later, my dad told me that was the chief. I thought that was my mama, but go well, ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing, like, despite all of the genocide and yeah. everything that they had lost, they retained that respect that I never saw, like in my culture, right? Mm -hmm. So that told me something right there. And I remember that night just having my whole world had been totally blown apart. Just by that little taste that there was a different reality right in my own backyard I didn't know about. It. And still to this day, when I talk about these crimes that happened, Canadians can't believe it. And I said, that's because you don't know what's going on in your own backyard. But Kevin, you know, you had a lot going on in your backyard and your front yard too. Um, you're talking about the upheavals and talking about the Maya. Talk a little bit about meeting mm -hmm. the Maya and, and how that came to be. Meeting Maya? From Mexico, way yeah. up in old, well, old Mexico. <laughs> yeah, what that old, old Mexico called Canada these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was when I was uh, training for the ministry. Uh, when I was 30, I decided to, uh, I didn't have a burning bush experience or anything like that. <laughs> a voice telling me to go to the church. You didn't burn any bush either. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, that was half my life ago. I'm 60 now. And, uh, but they, um, I went down on to Chiapas, Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, this is before the Zapatista rebellion, but it's the same area among mm -hmm. the Maya, the Mayan people. And these were Mayan refugees from Guatemala, mm -hmm. uh, from the military, the genocide there that, that happened. And uh, they were living in refugee camps along the border. And I went down there to, uh, I was part of kind of a f church fact-finding tour to, to, to see how we can help these people, right? Which mm -hmm. is ironic, because the very same church sponsoring us to do that had been killing off their own Indians in Canada, the That's United right. Church, That's right? right? So it's always easier to look uh, for their field mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what's going on. But anyway, I remember when I got there, uh, again, it was like going up to the village in northern BC when I was a teenager. Uh, there are kids running around every day, something like 30 to 40 children would die of malnutrition and typhus and things like that. And uh, the priest who was there, he was funny, he was an ex-Catholic priest who had been, like I would be one day, defrocked mm -hmm. for getting mm -hmm. too close mm -hmm. to the Indians, <laughs> right? And uh, That's why I want to read this name. Yeah, he's, uh, <laughs> Father Fidel, his name was. And, uh, Fidel. Fidel, his name. <laughs> so he took <laughs> the name. Because <laughs> the, the bishop tossed him out because he was getting too radical in his sermons, right? Yes. Uh, too, too much like Jesus, you know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but what's amazing, two years after I met him, he was actually...